Welcome to the University of Liverpool. This is the building where most of our research takes place and where we are going to learn about integrated pest management. Integrated pest management, or IPM, is an approach to pest control that uses a combination of biological, chemical, cultural and mechanical controls. The aim of IPM is to reduce crop damage by pests to economically tolerable levels rather than just totally eradicating the pest. However, sometimes IPM can take a while to take effect. Therefore, it's quite handy to have a good knowledge in crop and pest ecology. This will obtain the best results. If an IPM programme is well designed, it can reduce the cost and pesticide use by 50 to 90%. It will also reduce the use of fertilisers and help to slow the development of pesticide resistance. IPM also emphasises the use of environmentally sensitive pesticides. These are pesticides that aim specifically at the pest and not other species. This can help reduce pesticide resistance and is much more cost effective. But why would people bother to use IPM? Well, one of the main reasons is it's safer. This is because people and the environment are less exposed to chemicals that they don't really need to be exposed to. This in turn helps reduce pesticide resistance, meaning we can use these chemical controls and we really need them. Next is it's more effective as it really gets to the root of the problem that's causing these pests to be persistent. Lastly, is it's more cost effective. This is because it reduces the need for pests and fertilisers, so while it may cost more in the short term, it saves money in the long term. We are now going to look at the IPM cycle. IPM is essentially a cycle of several stages. The first stage in this cycle is soil preparation. Growers often give their plants a head start by several activities including choosing the proper site, testing the soil beforehand, rotating crops, creating raised beds where necessary and providing sufficient organic matter. Also, the environment can be disruptive for pests often by just sterilising greenhouse tools. The crop is then planted. Growers plant crop varieties that tolerate common problems. They also alter planting time and spacing to discourage certain diseases and insects. The following stages are continuous throughout the growth of a crop and should therefore be viewed as possibly being applied all at the same time. Specialist weather forecasts for farmers can help with pest management decisions whilst the crop is growing. It helps time the application of pesticides and fertilisers to get the best results. Also, it can help by just looking out for a pest on the crop. These pests are trapped and the damage is monitored. Pest trapping helps growers pinpoint when pests have arrived and to decide if the control is justified. Before treating, growers must wait until pest populations reach a scientifically determined level that could cause economic damage. Until that threshold is reached, the cost of the yield and quality loss will be less than the cost for control. One method of control in IPM is cultural or mechanical controls. An example of such a control is weeding or manually removing insects from a plant. It is important to remember, however, that throughout this whole process the use of controls is strongly influenced by the weather forecast and threshold levels. Another method of control in IPM is biological controls. Biological control is a form of pest control that uses other organisms. An example of this will be discussed later in this video. If the pest still persists above economically tolerable levels, then chemical controls such as pesticides, herbicides or fungicides have to be introduced. However, this chemical control has to be species specific so as to not cause damage to the rest of the ecosystem. The crops are then harvested and the management system is recorded and evaluated. Record keeping of the weather conditions, pest traps and treatment is important as it can allow faster future decisions. The cycle is complete. We are now going to look at two ways in which IPM is being used in the UK. The first example is a home use of IPM. So, we're in one of the greenhouses at the University of Liverpool 
and we use this one for growing plants that are then fed to insects um, for studying uh, insect behaviour experiments. And we've got maize here and uh, broad beans here. And um, these are grown throughout the year, winter and summer, as food for insects. So um, the greenhouses are kept lit and warm, and obviously that's an attractive um, place for insect pests. So we keep a good eye out, uh, looking at the leaves of the plants and their just general growth performance to see if there are any pests on them. We also have um, sticky uh, yellow strips that monitor flying insects and so we can see what's flying around in the greenhouse. And then um, if there are pests, we usually use uh, biological predators to keep them down because of course insecticides are not suitable for using them with these particular plants. Um, since they would, might then damage the experimental insects later on. So one of the big problems we have is the red spider mite and it sucks the sap from plants and it likes warm, fairly dry surroundings. We use the mite Phasalius, which is a predatory mite that eats the eggs and the adults of red spider mites. And um, when we notice that there is a mild infestation anywhere, we introduce um, a supply of the mites from a commercial supplier um, so that the predatory mites can then start eating on the eggs and adults of um, the pathogenic red spider mite. We are now going to look at how the firm Oxitex are involved in producing a range of IPM products. Oxitec is a small biotechnology company spin out from Oxford University to develop some particular genetic control methods developed at Oxford University. We're in the general environment of uh, integrated pest management, so by far the best known control method for insect pests are insecticides, so the spray chemical insecticides. And, and more generally, the ideal control method would integrate all available control methods to have something that was environmentally friendly and also much better able to withstand uh, the evolution of resistance in the pest. So if you just use one treatment, the pest insects will almost inevitably develop resistance to it. And you can manage that by having several different treatments and also by thinking what exactly it is you need, which may not be elimination of the pest, but just keeping them below a certain economic potential and so on. And so one of uh, the agricultural pest we focus on is olive fly and if you think about the damage that that can do you can you can lose the whole of the crop to to olive fly and it's not that it you know eats it like a, all of it like a swarm of locusts coming by leaving nothing in its, in its way or, uh, if you buy olives and you had a you know the, a jar of your olives on your plate if you bit into one of them and it had a maggot in it you wouldn't be too happy about that and you'd probably stop eating olives for some time and it's like that there's just no tolerance for uh, damage from the olive fly or, or, or its larvae, which are the, the maggot, uh, in the olive fruit. So olive growers have to be really careful uh, to control the olive fly and then also sort their olives to avoid that sort of damage. But the olive fly injects its egg into the olive. It has this long, sharp ovipositor with which it injects the egg into the, into the olive, which then develops inside. But that means that if, even if you'd sprayed a chemical on the surface of the olive, it probably wouldn't kill the larva because it bypassed it by the female inserting it inside. So it's very difficult to control them with, with insecticides and we try to use a genetic method to do that instead. If we could produce lots of sterile male olive fly, now of course the, the males don't lay eggs because they're male, but they'll go and make the females and they'll pass on a gene that kills the, uh, the offspring and then there'll be fewer, it probably won't save the olive in which the females laid the egg because that's still damaged. But in the next generation, there will be fewer olive fly and therefore less damage, and that's some kind of control. And if we can combine this with, with the other methods, um, well, the most simple method is trying to make sure you don't leave infested fruit lying around on the ground under the olive trees. And each of those methods in, in combination, we should be able to have a very specific uh, and targeted, and so with our method, the males would only make females of the same species. So even other species of fruit fly are not affected and much cleaner and more precise control methods than are available today.
Olifla is a big problem uh, for all the countries that it has been introduced, which is mainly the Mediterranean basin, basin and uh, California and Mexico that has been uh, recently introduced in the last decade or so. Now, traditionally, the way of dealing with olive fly was uh, by spraying uh, the olive trees with insecticides. Now, the problem that growers are facing today is that quite a lot of these insecticides have been phased out by the new EU regulation. Olive fly has developed immense resistance to existing insecticides. Biological control has been tried in the Mediterranean basis, but it hasn't produced uh, very good results. Our solution uh, relies on mass rearing a um, number of artificially made olive flies here in our labs. Um, we rear them, we release them in the environment so that uh, the ratio of the released males is higher than the existing uh, wild males in a given area. Uh, those, uh, we release males only and not females. What these oxytec males do is they will seek out the wild females, they will mate with those wild females, but all the female progeny of those matings will die. And as we can all imagine uh, the capacity, you know, the reproductive capacity of any given population is determined by the number of females and females alone. The method is uh, environmentally friendly, it doesn't leave any uh, residues in the environment, it's not based on uh, chemicals whatsoever.